go to our preaching time. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles in the New Testament to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I will start there with verse 1 and read down through verse 6. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I want to preach to you a sermon I call The Purpose of Faith. The Purpose of Faith. And uh, there will only be two points to it, but they're kind of wordy. I'll give you time to write them down if you're writing them down when we get along there. But the purpose of faith is given to us here in verses 1, 2, and 3. Uh, to make real to you things that you can't prove are real by the five physical senses alone. Sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. The writer says faith is the substance of things hoped for. And then he says it's the evidence of things not seen. So faith is both substance and evidence, according to the Bible. Years ago, uh, during the course of my day job, I heard a Buddhist priest at a funeral say that beside the five physical senses, there's also a sixth sense that is often ignored or missed by most people. And that is what we would call the sense of experience. Um, even though you have no way of demonstrating that something will turn out a certain way, no way of proving that it will, your experience in the past tells you this is not going to turn out well, or that this is going to turn out well. And I suppose there's some uh, truth in that observation. They talk about a cop's gut feeling, right? A woman's intuition. I never have understood that one. A woman's intuition. Women just simply, at least my wife, and I love my wife, but she tells me what she thinks I need to know. And whether I take it in, in the right spirit, that's up to me. That's on me. But even though you have no way of demonstrating a thing or proving a thing, experience tell you, tells you that it is. And uh, you'd bet anything you have on it turning out that way because of what you've seen in the past. Uh, you know something is real and true, although it's difficult, maybe even impossible, to prove to everyone's satisfaction. So we won't kid ourselves. Uh, that's part of faith. And so point number one, and maybe a little bit wordy, the purpose of faith is to make real to you what can't be proven by the senses alone by the senses alone. Years ago, the newspaper, the local newspaper was running several stories on evolution and how we needed more evolution in the public school classrooms. And um, I wrote several letters to the newspaper, you know, those uh, letters from the readers type section, um, opposing it or uh, objecting to it. I think I enlisted Sister Carlene's son. Uh, I, they only let you write so many letters per month so I'd write more than that, and then I'd sign one of her son's names to it. That way, that way the information gets in the paper uh, all the same. That's called Christian cheating. <laughs> my grandfather, I, I've given you the, the example of my grandfather. He was a Christian cheater. It was a good one, too. And uh, JWs would come to his door and knock on his door, and he'd open the door and uh, try to talk to them. And just inside the front door by the light switch, he had a piece of paper taped. And all the key verses that he wanted to talk to them about. 
So out of the corner of his eye, he's looking to see what he wants to talk about next. That's the way you do it. He was clever. He was a clever man. And um, he's in heaven now, too. He had some, before they got those big plastic dumpster trash cans that we all have, he used to have metal trash barrels. And there'd be two strong guys riding on the back of that trash truck, and they'd dump those barrels into the back of the trash. How many remember that? Well, once they got those automated things with one guy in a, in a you know, a robotic arm, they got, they fired two guys, you know, two guys lost their jobs. <laughs> but uh, he'd have some dogs in the neighborhood that were out sniffing around his trash barrels, knocking over his trash cans before the trash truck would come by. So he got a long extension cord and he frayed the ends on one end and hooked that over the barrel, the, ha the metal handle. And they plugged it in. <laughs> and once the, once the dogs came, were sniffing around, they'd get a shock and they'd let out a scream and run off. And then, of course, he'd, he'd unplug it before the trash truck came. But he didn't have any problem with the dogs anymore after that. He was a very clever man. But uh, so I concluded one letter to the newspaper on evolution by saying evolutionists must cling to their beliefs the way all religionists do, and I quoted Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Evolution, <clears throat> excuse me, evolutionists can't prove something like the Big Bang Theory as the start of the cosmos. All that really proves is that once upon a time there was nothing, and then suddenly there was everything. But we already believe that from Genesis 1, right? And um, the true miracle is thinking that it could happen without God. That requires much more faith than I'm able to produce. You know, things are, things are modified. Things can be beautified. Things are reorganized. Things can be updated. Things can be upgraded. But nothing evolves. The word evolution suggests automatic progress forward and upward without any purpose or direction behind it. And that don't happen. And nor can they demonstrate what's called macro evolution. One species suddenly becoming a new species. There are so many gaps in the fossil record of those missing links. Those missing links about 40 years ago were referred to as hopeful monsters. Hopeful monsters. We're hoping to find some hybrid skeletons somewhere that will show this thing slowly transitioned into that thing. They haven't found it yet. But evolution is the substance of things that they hope for. They think that if they can discuss uh, biology and anthropology, even geology, um, using terms that most people aren't familiar with, quantum leap theory, punctuated equilibrium, without mentioning the word God or the mentioning the word creation or miracle, that whatever they say after that will be taken as scientific fact, even if it's not scientific. And to a large extent, they've been very successful thanks to the propaganda, propagandizing of the uh, public school system, the National Education Association, uh, liberal politicians, the news media. We have an entire generation of people today who know nothing about the word of God or the miracle of God creating the world and man and the plant life and the tree life and the animal life. They know nothing about the commands of God given in the word of God. And then we have a whole cadre, a whole army of modern day preachers who have never seen the word of God. Well, the word of God is the original manuscripts. We believe it was inspired in the original. Who could, who could prove they were? Who could prove they weren't? Nobody's ever found the originals. All we've ever had are copies of copies of copies from which we translate our Bibles. So if you don't believe that God is involved in preserving his book so that you can hold a pure copy of it, then why are you wasting your time calling yourself a pastor or a minister? Because they give you good income and it's very little uh, effort put forth. All you, have, you know what's... It's sad, 
And, and maybe our church, uh, we spend a lot of time railing and uh, accusing modern day preachers of, of being shallow in the scriptures. And it's because they are shallow in the scriptures. Uh, Chuck Smith was a great soul winner in, uh, of his sort, uh, head of, father of the uh, Calvary Chapel movement. I'm not going to de deny that he was saved. I'm not going to deny that he won souls to the Lord. But Chuck Smith was a very shallow student in the Word of God. Whatever he taught that was right, he simply took off the pages of the Schofield Reference Bible or books by Hal Lindsey or Salem Kerbant, some of those guys who were popular authors in the 70s. And then a guy takes a trip to Israel and he sees the sites the tour guide points out to him and he thinks now he's an expert on Israeli geography and topography and the history of Israel. You can, go the, you can go to Israel and see the Catholic Church's version of where Jesus was born and where Jesus was buried. And then you can go to the, the non-Catholic and see where they think Jesus was buried. It's a guessing game, uh, largely. I think the Protestants probably have better um, archaeological testimony why it's a garden, it was a garden tomb. It's an outdoor location. The Catholic Church will take you to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as a church built around the site, and there's a hole in the ground where they think Jesus' uh, tomb once was. That doesn't sound anything like the garden tomb where they found the Lord Jesus missing. But uh, be that as it is, uh, my mom asked me recently if I was ever interested in taking a trip to Israel. As, as a Christian, I suppose. And I suppose if someone was paying my way, I'd go. Otherwise... I think I said, I'm going to wait until the rapture and uh, when the Lord Jesus sets up his kingdom, then I'll know exactly where everything was. I'll know what's what, what wasn't what. It's, that's probably not a good sentence. But, but I'll know what's true, what, what wasn't true. I'll let him explain it to me. And um, what a day that's going to be. To think, to think that you and I will go and worship and serve the Son of God, seated upon a glorified throne, ruling over the world and the entire universe by extension, and you and I then uh, possessing glorified form, incorruptible, immortal, supernatural bodies that will never wear out or get sick again, and do His bidding throughout all of eternity. Wow! I can't wait! But faith is, but faith in something um, that isn't true isn't really faith. It's foolishness. We might call it blind faith. You and I freely admit that we can't prove certain things. I can't prove the existence of heaven or the reality of, of heaven or hell. I can't prove the new birth. I can't prove the forgiveness of my sins. I can't prove that the Holy Spirit lives inside of me and so forth. But at least we're honest about it. We'll admit the things that we can't prove. The secularist, the evolutionist, he can't prove any of those crazy things he believes. But he won't admit it. He, he wants you to accept it as fact by government edict. We're going to force the teaching of that doctrine on students in school. Think about it this way. Most Americans, taxpaying Americans who fund public schools, believe in God and they have some belief in the truth of the Word of God, and they may be members of some church somewhere, and they attend periodically, but they, they believe uh, generally that the Scriptures are telling them the truth. And they pay taxes to a government system that turns around and tries to indoctrinate their children in those public schools to no longer believe in God. The school system and the government is largely funded in the United States by people who believe in God and, and to some degree trust the scriptures to be true. Uh, and yet the government is doing all it can to undermine that belief. To slap them in the face and say, we'll take your money to fund our socialist uh, experiments, but we don't want you mentioning God or Jesus Christ. No prayer on this school campus. No Bible on this school campus. You know something? You'll be issued a Bible once you enter a federal prison. If you want one, you go ask the chaplain, they'll get you a Bible. But for some reason, you're not supposed to have one when you go to a public school. Go figure. If they emphasize the Bible 
in the one place, it might keep them out of the other place later on. But you and I freely admit the things that we can't prove. The trouble with the secularists, the evolutionists, he won't admit it. He believes in crazier things, but won't admit it. This takes me back to the, the first point, which we started on. The purpose of faith is to make real to you things that you can't prove are real by the, the mere senses alone. And point number two, faith is only real faith if it's placed in something that is so. It might sound like these two points are in opposition to each other, but I don't really think they are. There was a very old Hindu belief that the world was flat and it rested in outer space on the backs of four giant turtles in outer space. Now, obviously that idea was wrong, even if it gave uh, great comfort to the people who believed it. It was still wrong. All the faith in the world can't change something if it's not so to start with. The Mormon religion claims that 600 years before Christ, a ship full of Jews left Jerusalem, they sailed out of the Mediterranean across the ocean, and they settled here in North America, and they became the America, later, the, uh, these were tribes of, of Jews who left here, and they became the ancestors of the American Indians, the Native Americans. This is essentially the, the story of the Book of Mormon. And then uh, after Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives, he came back down here in glorified form and preached to those Jews who were living here in, Cal in uh, North America. There's not one bit of evidence either archaeologically, historically, linguistically, genetically, uh, or anything in the, in the antiquity of the Jews to support those claims. Not one thing. The Smithsonian Institute uh, is charged with documenting and chronicling the life and the history of this continent. One of the most well-funded research institutions in the world. They document and chronicle every type of flower, every type of insect, every type of animal, uh, every not only history of people, uh, trees, forestation, uh, geology, changes in weather patterns, they, they, they document everything. And uh, there is no evidence that the story of the Mormon uh, legend is true. Just about all the evidence points to Chinese coming across the Bering Strait, the land bridge that connected uh, China, or at least a, a series of islands connecting China to uh, Alaska, and then down the western coast of the U.S., and then across the rest of the nation after that, and even farther south uh, into Mexico and Central and South America over time, uh, intermixing with the Spaniard uh, colonists from, from Europe who came over here, etc., and all that seemed to be very uh, uh, well documented, uh, well testified to. But uh, the Mormon claims uh, nothing, none of it. All the faith in the world can't change something to be true if it's not true to start with. Well, all the faith in the world, it won't make a difference. Let me ask you, if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he was buried uh, that he rose again from the dead and promises to give you eternal life if you'll trust in his work for your sake. You're still lost and you're still on your way to hell if he didn't do those things, right? Faith is only faith if it's placed in something that's so. And I'm thankful that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is so. As a Christian, you're asked to believe a number of things that seem unbelievable. They seem ridiculous in the eyes of the world. For example, do you really believe that God formed the first man and then took a rib out of his side and turned that into his wife? You're asked to believe it. Do you believe that God told one man to build a big wooden ark to save his family of eight and two of every kind of animal from a worldwide flood that would come upon the earth? You're asked to believe it, but do you? Do you believe that a Jew hanging on a cross, a Roman cross, outside the 
city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago was suffering for your chance to be reconciled to a holy God? You're asked to believe it. The purpose of faith uh, is to make things true that you can't prove are true by the senses alone. And also, faith is only faith if it's placed in something that is true. Like I say, those almost sound like they contradict each other, but I don't think they do. Someone might say, I can't believe in that story of Adam's rib. And yet, in a way, that's where women have wanted to be ever since that time. Yep. Right by their husband's side. And he wants to have his arm around his wife. If he's, a, if he's an affectionate man, if he's a, a boor, uh, then forget it. Sorry about that man, ladies. But, uh, but his uh, arm around his wife. Back to where things started. And uh, do you find it rather uh, telling that little things in the world seem to suggest that something once ago, long ago happened to start the whole tradition? You know, it's rather telling these days. People will see the lives of a politician, they'll watch the lives of the conduct of some actress, some actor, uh, People magazine, some celebrity, some singer that they're hooked on, and they'll say, so-and-so wasn't wearing her wedding ring at the red carpet again last week. Does that indicate there's trouble at home between her and her husband so-and-so? And I don't know why people let themselves get caught up in the lives of losers, but they do. But they do. Uh, my goodness, People Magazine, that's one of those most popular... Ma you know that guy, Ken Jennings, the all-time winner on Jeopardy years ago? The guy won like 75 games in a row. I forget how many millions of dollars that guy piled up in his, uh, uh, in his winnings before someone beat him. Most of the questions that they asked that guy were just stuff you could dri derive out of People Magazine every week. Nonsense issues, nonsense details, nonsense trivia. But people get all caught up in it. And the truth is, many times, those little things like a missing wedding ring, and he wasn't wearing it at, at that event, they do indeed indicate that something behind the scenes was going on. Their lives get all scrutinized and examined and seen under a microscope of public opinion and so forth. And it's interesting that little things along the way can serve as road signs, markers, signposts to say that something must have happened long ago that got us to this place now where we have certain legends, certain stories that are told. Do you know that in almost every country, uh, the Genesis chapter 6 says there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they took them wives of all which they chose, the same became mighty men of old men, which were uh, men of renown. Don't you think that it's possible that the stories of Greek heroes, God's intermixing with earthly and mortal people, might be based on some event that actually happened? Genesis 6, we believe, tells us the truth. And all those others are legends that have been developed over the centuries since that time. But every country in this world just about has some legend of local giants that once roamed that continent, once roamed that land. We have uh, stories here that are not told very often anymore, but uh, uh, Pecosville um, and also, what was the other one? Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan. Those are American legends of giants. Paul Bunyan was a giant cowboy who, uh, I don't know if he rode a giant horse or not, but but on nearly every uh, every society, every culture has local stories of giants that once roamed the earth. Could it possibly be that maybe once upon a time there were giants roaming the earth? Now here, Bible Baptist Church, we don't doubt that at all. We believe it's true. We believe once upon a time... Uh, there were giants, and they were the offspring of angels mixing with mortal women. 
and uh, because of their corruption uh, in their uh, in their uh, procreation, God drowned them out with the rest of the world. But um, maybe every boat, maybe every dinghy, maybe every lifeboat, every yacht, every rowboat, every canoe, every luxury liner, uh, all uh, ever launched by man are testimonies to the truth that of Noah's story. How do we survive on the top of the water and escape the, the murky depths below? And of course, Noah's Ark has been long since discovered. They've got competing videos as to Noah's Ark. Now, they don't just have one, they have two sites they believe Noah's Ark was at. The earlier one, which was popular in the 70s in the Ahura Gorge in the mountains of Ararat, they say that area is covered with snow most all year long. But they've taken satellite uh, uh, images of that area, and, you know, those, the uh, computer systems that are able to, to uh, map out the topography and the shape of some object underneath the snow showed it to be long and rectangular in shape, just like the description of the ark found in the book of Genesis. And then now they've got this tourist attraction place that looks like a, a long ship from point to point with a, a rounded body that collapsed in on itself like it had a, a hull. But that's not how the ark was described in the book of Genesis. So if I were a betting man, my money would be on the one that's still under ice there. It's very hard to access. Something that become a, uh, becomes a popular tourist trap is usually wrong. People go and they want to watch uh, some statue of the Virgin Mary crying or shedding blood for lost sinners and somehow press their beads against they get a miracle. You're not getting anything except deceived. But anyone can buy videos of documentaries of the discovery of Noah's Ark made by, by uh, saved and unsaved production companies alike. The whole world is a parable. And the whole world is intended to illustrate a Bible truth, um, confirm a Bible truth, or point to something in the future the Bible says will happen eventually. Romans 1 verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. His eternal power and Godhead, the very nature of the Godhead or the Trinity can be taught, it can be believed by observing the created world around you. If you could, could divide water into three containers, one liquid, the other, another one ice, and the other one convert into steam, you can do different jobs with any one of those three elements. You can do some things with steam that you can't do with ice and vice versa. And, uh, but if you could melt the ice and somehow collect and trap the steam, put it all back together with the liquid, there'd be no uh, break in its composition. It'd still be two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. That's not a perfect way of illustrating it, but it's sufficient to illustrate the fact that the Trinity can be believed, even if I can't fully understand it, even if I can't fully explain it, I can see elements and uh, in nature and in the world created around me to tell me that it can be so. Now you might call examples like these road signs to lead you to a right knowledge of God. Uh, but faith uh, is to make real to you things you can't prove are real by the senses. And faith is only faith if it's placed in something that's so. What about the Lord Jesus Christ? Can a sinner actually reach back in time and apply the merit of Jesus' death at Calvary to his needy soul right now? Amen. That's what I did November 5th, 1967. God saved me as a six-year-old boy. Why shouldn't that be possible? You know, what's one of the main themes in modern movies these days? Time travel. As we go forward in time, go back in time. You waste your time on YouTube, you'll see videos by nuts who say they are a time traveler. They've got selfies they took in the year 2030, uh, 2000 or 2300 to prove that they're a time traveler. You prove a lot of things, but you're not a time traveler.
go forward in time, go backward in time. Make sure if you go backward in time, you don't fool with the events of history, or otherwise when you come back to the present, things will have developed differently, right? Adolf Hitler will now be the head of the Democratic Party. Oh wait, he is. No way he isn't. And that's another subject we won't get into in much detail, but if you vote for a Democrat in the United States, I'm going to question your salvation. And, and if you vote for half of the Republicans, I'll question your salvation. Salvation is not in politics. It's only in trusting the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, Twilight Zone and Star Trek and Back to the Future and all those other shows ad nauseum. So why should it be hard to believe that if Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16, and therefore he had no sins of his own that needed to be forgiven, Hebrews 4.15, that his death uh, uh, was suffered on your behalf, Romans, 8, or, uh, Romans 5 and verse 8, and that you can be reconciled to God by trusting in his work, 2 Corinthians 5.18. His actions in the past can offer you salvation in the present, and eternity in the future. That's the promise of God. And uh, the purpose of faith, as I said before, is to make real to you things you can't prove are real by the five senses. And also, faith is only faith if it's placed in something that is so. Christ's death on a cross is a historical event. That's not a religious argument. It's a, it's a historical event. Can you take one step necessary and believe that it was for your sake, that it was on your behalf, for the sake of your sins. If you can do that, God's got good news for you. He wants to save you. He's ready and willing and, and anxious to save you. But that's what God asks. Jesus said in John 7, verses 16 and 17, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. The world says, seeing is believing. But the word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ say, believe. And then you'll start to see. You'll begin to see by your experience with Jesus Christ, by your day-to-day -day fellowship with him, by your conversing with him in prayer, by his talking to you, by his book. It's amazing. You can read the Bible and if you're not saved, it's a locked book to you. It's like there's a, a spiritual padlock on that, and you can't make heads or tails of it. But once you know the author, it begins to open up to you. And you have no trouble believing. Every, you know, uh, Bob Jones Sr. said, uh, I never met the Catholic or the Jew or the atheist who, once he got saved, didn't suddenly believe all the Bible. And it opens up to you in ways that it never could before. And the Apostle John writes, This is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. But faith is only a real faith if it's placed in something that's so. And the purpose of faith is to make things, uh, convince you of things, that cannot be uh, learned by the five senses alone. 